Skyrim's like a handsome hooker addicted to crack. He's down to do just about anything and is permeated with STDs that have gone untreated, including syphilis, which has slowly eaten away his brain and any depth he might have had before he started turning tricks in the airport bathroom. Remember, kids, you won't find any glory in that side of the hole. But like any good hooker, you'll probably get your money's worth and have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. Now that we've gotten our mandatory sex joke out of the way, what is Skyrim? Skyrim is dirty. It's unpolished. And riddled with phlebitis. And fun as hell. You can lose many hours of your life playing the game the way the developers meant for you to play it. Or you can play it the way that their terrible design decisions allow you to play it. So can we level our character to level 50 without even playing it? Well, let's dig in, shall we? God damn it, this game is hard to talk about. On one hand, you got guys who shit on the game and say it's the worst thing that Bethesda's ever made, which is disingenuous at best. And on the other hand, you got people who say it's the best game that Bethesda's ever made. It's as if none of these people ever played Redguard, an Elder Scrolls story. So I want to start by saying that Skyrim's not a bad game. Let's get that out of the way right up front so all you maniacs out there waiting with bated breath to jump on every little thing that I say can close the video and queue up something else. And for all those that thought I hated Oblivion, I can only say, huh? I love that game. But you can critique something that you love. In fact, you should because it's how you grow as a person by examining the things that you enjoy and seeing their flaws. It's how illustrators get better at their craft and how YouTubers make money. So, calm your tits, Mr. and Mrs. YouTube viewer. You needn't get your identity tangled up in a media you like, okay? I'm not using any mods for this one and instead opted to go with Skyrim Special Edition for my analysis. It works right out of the box, so no dicking around with unofficial patches or weird glitches in mod ordering. Actually, scratch that. There's plenty of glitches. And it looks good right out of the box, so you don't have to worry about any beautification patches or anything like that. I chose this version of the game for several reasons, chiefly of which is the performance performance game. The game runs without hitching or frame loss at a steady 60 FPS, and according to the patch notes this is due in part to the fact that this is on the 64-bit version of Bethesda's engine, so it has better memory management. No longer are you stuck with just 4 gigs of memory, so mod to your heart's content. And in the over 40 hours of gameplay I put in for this analysis, the game never crashed on me once, so that in and of itself is a big achievement for Bethesda. From Oblivion to Skyrim, the races have undergone some great and terrible changes. Breton's got fucked right in the pooper by having her magic resist half down from 25% and having her bonus to magicka reduced from 50 points to fucking nothing! I want you to imagine Todd Howard behind a Breton, holding his head down into a pillow as he cries out for him to stop. And that is a description of what they did to the Bretons. Look at the mask of my boy. Altmer, on the other hand, seem to have been touched in the no-nos by God, and the result is that they are the only race to get a bonus to Magicka, as well as a power that allows them to regen Magicka 25 times faster for 60 seconds, which is about 25% of total Magicka per second. I'll say that again. 25 times faster for 60 seconds. The Imperial race always finds more gold. Basically, they have a 100% chance to find anywhere between 2 to 10 extra gold in all chests. Dunmer can now surround themselves in flames, which damage anyone around them. They can no longer summon their dead grandparents to fight for them, however, so race ruined. Orcs have by far the best melee ability, which is the ability to do double damage and take half damage at will once a day. Why is this so good? Well, just imagine making a stealth dagger orc that does 30 times damage on a successful stealth attack. What about the cat race, the Khajiit? Well, Let's just say that their unarmed damage leaves a little to be desired and come back to this topic in the skills section. Dunmer and the Nords have the best racial passives against dragons. Nords get the nicest resists with their 50% frost resist because a ton of NPCs and creatures in this game do frost damage, and a lot of the dragons in late game do tons of frost. And Dunmer get 50% to fire, which is super good against dragons in the early game and can easily be buffed to the cap. Argonians, on the other hand, have 25% weakness to frost, so that is a hole you're gonna wanna, you know, enchant your way out of before level 10. The Red Guard are once again the best at one-handed weapons, 
and they get a 50% resist to poison, which I have never found to be all that useful. Their adrenaline rush, which now only regens stamina 10 times faster for 60 seconds, is useful at times, but not really useful enough to justify going into the menu and fucking around with that shit every time you want to use it. There are three attributes in Skyrim. Would you like to take a guess at what they are? No? It's health, magicka, and fatigue. Guess what they do? Go ahead, hold it. Yep, that's exactly what they do. Yeah, health is how many times you can get hit, and that's a flat value across all races. Magicka is how many times you can make sparkles come out of your fingers, and that is a flat value except if you're an Ultimar. And fatigue is how much you can run, block, and do power attacks before you get winded and have to take a nap. And that's it. A couple of problems here with this shit. First off, let's talk about speed. Speed is the same across all races. And the only thing that modifies it is the height of your character, but if you ask me how much, I can only shrug. So everyone, regardless of physiology, moves at relatively the same speed, even those that walk on stilts. Uh, oh wait, 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 yeah, cross that out, huh? Yeah, cats and lizard bros no longer have tarsal joints like cats and dogs, which is most likely an effort to simplify the process of animation and the creation of armor. But I, I thought not being able to wear boots was actually a nice way to drive the point home that these are not normal races. They're beast races, so yeah. No race is healthier than another race because apparently environmental factors have no effect on people's physiology whatsoever! In Skyrim, the video game which is the RPG equivalent of purgatory. Everything is neutral, nothing matters, I fuck the whole thing. And now a message from our sponsor. Did you know that Vignar Greymane is making shady underground deals in his bid for Councilman of Whiterun? But Vignar is hateful and irresponsible. That position requires the utmost trust in your elected government officials. But do you know what Vignar does in his spare time when no one is looking? He kills kids. This message was brought to you by the Memorial for the Battleborn Clan. Strength used to modify how hard your characters hit things. While in Skyrim, strength no longer exists, and the only thing that modifies it are spell effects, perks, and items. How often you stagger is no longer determined by your agility. How much cool shit you find is no longer determined by how lucky you are. Shit, your personality no longer matters. So long as you got a mouth that speaks honeyed words, people everywhere will love you. Even if your breath smells like the inside of a dead cat's asshole and your face looks like a freshly stepped in dog shit. In one game release, Bethesda managed to cull so many mechanics and the depth that those mechanics bring, simplifying everything to the point where you no longer need to really think about your choices. Now on to derive stat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're coming to the real big change here, and that's skills. But before we move forward, we need to address that big, fat, bloated old dude in the corner. Yes, the skill system has changed, but I can't say if it's for the better or for the worse. The system has its dizzying highs and its roller coaster lows. On one hand, the system provides you with an insane amount of versatility in classes, and you can specialize in things that you might not have actually specialized with before because you can branch out without penalty and dip into skills you might not normally try. With the perk system, it is possible to mix and match certain features. For instance, to buff your magical resist, you can take the Atronach perk from the Alteration Tree, and you'll absorb 30% of the spells that come at you and restore your magicka with it. So there's no longer a need for a star sign or anything, but I gotta say, that's part of my problem with this. The star signs were unique. 
They were cool. They were a feature that you guys basically invented. I mean, maybe Ultima had you on that with the card system before. This was a really good thing. It made the character you were making unique to all the other characters. Instead, now it's just sort of homogenized. Every character you end up making ends up feeling a little bit the same because the character develops because of your habits and not because of a build that you're going for. You know, I like, I always hear people complain about how when they're playing this game, they always end up just playing a heavy armor conjuration mage or, or a light armor stealth archery build. And a lot of this has to actually do with level scaling, which I won't get into much right here. But basically, when you open up a system like this and you allow people to pick whatever they want, what they end up drifting towards is whatever makes the journey to get to the end easier, whatever their end goal might be. And people like that who are very concerned with that might end up going out and looking for a build guide online or something, right? But for most players, I think what happens is they fall into that rhythm because it makes the journey to get to the end easier and they actually end up getting afraid of branching out to other skills. And this system allows for experimentation, which is great, and it inspires people to go out searching, but like I said, it's a path of least resistance thing. If they find that the journey is harder doing X, then they're gonna make sure they always do Y. So if they find that stealth archery is like a really easy way to get through the entire game without having the inconvenience of dying all the time, well, they're probably gonna drift towards that. So that's why when you're doing a perk system like this, it's so difficult because you really have to take all of those things into consideration, the unpredictability of players and the skills that they'll mix and match. Because you wanna make sure that you balance the game, right? Like you want it to be fun to play, easy to handle, but you don't want it to be easy to beat. You want it to be challenging. So a little bit of challenge goes a long way. And in this system, you'll find that it's very easy to break this game and have it be not challenging at all. You really want to make sure that there's not like one or two really meta builds. You want to make everything sort of powerful enough in order to compete with all the other easier ways to do things so that it's all fun. And I'd say for the most part, the skill tree manages to do that. The only problem is, is that it doesn't really advertise itself very well in the way that it's presented, unfortunately. That there are amazing builds out there that are super fun and unique to play with, but, you know, most people won't ever discover it because of the way it's presented. Okay, ran over. Back to perks. Some of the perks that you take can actually change the way some of the weapons handle, and therefore, how you play the game. So I naturally like that about the system. But on the other hand, it overcomplicates what used to be an easy system to grasp, and instead of being more transparent with the numbers that are in the background, what we got were several skill trees that we need to navigate in order to get the build that we need to make. I mean, you need a goddamn spreadsheet and a flowchart to figure this shit out. But look, at the end of the day, the freedom the system gives you allows you to level into your heart's content and max out every skill to one. What it doesn't do, however, is allow you to select every perk from every skill. In order to do that, you must grind out legendary skills. And eventually, you can max out every perk. That way, the game has some life beyond the level cap. There's a problem with this, however. If you legendary a combat skill, you've made your life unnecessarily hard. Because you'll be doing hardly any damage to the enemies that spawn around level 80. And your armor rating and health pool might be large enough for that to not matter, but it's still a tedious grind to do it that way, and the alternatives are no better. Most people will legendary a crafting skill and grind that out, but oh my fucking god, how boring is that shit? No thanks, not worth it, I got better shit to do with my time, thank you very much. This isn't the only way that Skyrim has streamlined the systems from Oblivion, however. Skyrim managed to cut out five more skills this time around. Mysticism, which was already dying by the time they cut it. Athleticism, acrobatics, unarmored, and hand-to-hand. -hand. So at least your space bar can take a nice, big, deep breath and sigh of relief. Illusion was absolutely fucking gutted. It's a shadow of its former self. No more chameleon, no more charm, no more paralyze or command creature. In Skyrim, Illusion was cut from 13 spell effects to 8 spell effects. Destruction and Restoration get the biggest buff from Oblivion. Oblivion had 24 Destruction spell effects and Skyrim has 32 spell effects. Which, if you think about it, is kind of a problem. Skyrim emphasizes straight up killing shit as opposed to unique ways you could kill people in Morrowind and to a lesser extent Oblivion. Here's what I find annoying about this. Illusion was a great school of magic. It had uses inside and outside of combat. And those uses stretched from warrior utilities like Calm to thieving utilities like Chameleon. Here's a neat trick for you Oblivion fans. See an NPC that's carrying an item you want? Cast Frenzy and Rally on him, and you can kill him without getting a bounty. It's easy peasy lemon squeezy. Guess what you can't do in Skyrim? That.
You can't fucking do that anymore because casting frenzy is considered assault and causes you to get a bounty. I guess it makes sense, but I mean, <laughs> the fuck, can I have fun? Restoration has 25 effects in Oblivion and Skyrim has a metric shit ton, which again is exactly what Skyrim is emphasizing. Straightforward, streamlined combat, which is easier if you have many ways of keeping yourself alive. Now look, I'm just as big a fan of shooting lightning out of my hands as any red-blooded patriot middle-aged balding YouTuber, but looking cool is not a replacement for doing cool things. These skills and spell schools get cut because only a minority of people play these skills, and game developers know this shit because of telemetry, self-reporting surveys, and user experience research. Research. That's why they can make fairly safe cuts, but Bethesda doesn't do any of that shit. And instead of using a scalpel, they use a goddamn machete and start swinging wildly. They see a fun exploit born of systems interacting with one another as bugs that need to be ironed out. And they see actual bugs as shippable features. Their fucking value system is all over the goddamn map. Spears, blunt, axe, long blade, and short blade have gone the way of the dodo. If you know how to use a one-handed weapon, you know how to use them all. And what's really fucked up is that I've heard people actually call this a better system than Oblivion. And I guess in some ways it is, but you know what's really fucking crazy? What really pushes my nipples inside out? It's this goddamn shit. This overly complicated bullshit representative of nothing giving vague promises of what might happen when you buy something from one of its many trees. And a lot of the time, that promise is misleading. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with these trees. If you do them right, you can have a very interesting system. The problem is, they are very easy to do wrong. Skyrim admittedly doesn't do much wrong here. The problem I have with it is that it's a solution to a problem that didn't exist. The solution for Morrowind and Oblivion was fine. All I would have liked to see was more information on screen while I adjust things. So instead of getting rid of a system that wasn't 100%, what they could have done was show our statistics like melee DPS, spell DPS, armor rating, shit like that on one screen as we increase our stats. A really awesome example of this can be found in Dark Souls games, which depending Depending on the armor and weapon you have equipped show you how your stats change with each increase of a given stat. Instead of something that makes sense, we have this overly complicated shit and a system that was likely made to streamline something to better communicate info to a player not used to RPG systems in fact overcomplicates something that used to be simple but was gimped by a lack of information on the screen. Let's try to make sense of this nonsense, shall we? First, we need to talk about unarmed and... Look at the mask of my boy. Unarmed is no longer a skill, so if you choose this as a weapon of choice, you do so for the memes and those badass kill cam animations. If you're looking to do an unarmed build, become a vampire. Get the 20 damage bonus the claw from Vampire Lord. Get Fist of Steel from the Heavy Armor Tree. In fact, max out Heavy Armor. Your Khajiit Claws will do 12 extra points of damage. Your Gauntlet Armor Rating increases damage further, but only from the base armor rating. Then you can enchant your Gauntlets to do even more bonus damage. And if you really want to do it right, exploit the Necromage perk. Without the Necromage exploit, this is what hand-to-hand -hand looks like, and it's okay, except when you go against the dragon. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of hand-to-hand -hand with a dragon and two-handed with the same dragon.
notice a difference? The two-hander not only stuns the dragon constantly, but because it has magical effects on it, it is also doing a ton of damage. Unlike hand-to-hand, -hand, where it is chip damage that doesn't seem to stun so much. Now what about two-handers when the skill is maxed out and all the perks have been bought? Yeah. You drop that fucking dragon like a sack of potatoes. All of this is not to say that you can't do an unarmed build, you can. It just isn't very fun because it's not a skill, so you're not leveling as quickly as you would if you used any other weapon. So it looks like you win, Bethesda. Hand to hand is dead. I hope you're happy with yourselves. And now, a word from our sponsor. Hello. This is Les Tolliver of Pussy Slayer Inc. And I want to talk to you about an opportunity to get the gate to any woman's panties open in just five easy steps so that you can smash that puss into oblivion! All you need is the new book from Pussy Slayer Publishing, The Doors of Oblivion. And before you ask, no, this is not a pyramid scheme. All you need to do is buy 500 copies of Pussy Slayer's book, The Doors of Oblivion and then recruit a friend to do the same. The book will literally sprout wings and fly off of your shelves. Let's say you have no cash and your friend is as broken as a dysfunctional family Christmas. No problem, my dudes. For a limited time, the publisher of Doors of Oblivion, Mr. Skellington Skellingtonsworth, is willing to give you a copy of Pussy Slayer's new book, Free, free of, of charge. charge! That's right, I said free, free of, of charge. charge! So get yourself to the sightless pit and get a free copy of the book that will change your life. Only 1,000 copies per person. Offer is subject to change. Offer void where prohibited. Pussy Slayer Inc. is a fully incorporated subsidiary of Bethesda Inc. This is not a pyramid scheme. Book available on VHS recording. Order now! Now, speaking of weapons, let's start off by looking at one-handed skills. The first perk in most skill trees is usually the same per type. For spells, your novice spell cost is halved. With weapons, your damage is increased by 20% per level. And there's usually five levels, so by the time you max that skill, you'll have about 100% extra damage. I will not be mentioning this perk again, so for two-handed and archery, just keep that in mind. I found that in this tree, swords are the most underwhelming while maces and axes seem to cut motherfuckers down pretty much quick like and in a hurry. Mostly because each weapon's subtype gets their own specific modifier. So for instance, Bladesman gives you a 10%, a 15%, and a 20% chance of doing extra crit damage. And let me tell you, this perk is bullshit. Level one may give you a 10% chance to do crit damage, but guess how much crit damage you actually do? It's zero. Yeah, you do zero extra crit damage. Yeah, I didn't believe that shit either when when I read it, but it's true. In classic fucking Bethesda, you have to invest three points into this to get a measly fucking 50% extra crit damage, where maces enjoy a perk where you ignore 25%, 50%, and 75% at max of the enemy's armor rating. I know what weapon I pick when I'm going one-handed, but I'd be wrong, see? Because NPCs are the only enemies in the game that have armor rating. According to running the console command, get AV, space, damage resist, no animal or monster, aside from Dramora, have an armor rating or melee damage resist. That means that what you'll be fighting roughly half the game will not be affected by Mace's armor ignore perk. In fact, no single weapon should ever be used for all occasions. To be truly useful, these perks would have needed to be purchased together so that you can use one-handed weapons against monsters and some other type of one-handed weapon against NPCs wearing armor. This isn't something communicated very well by Bethesda. For example, in the Witcher games, if you don't use the correct type of weapon for monsters, your damage to them falls off dramatically, which tells the player they're using the wrong weapon. That's also why silver's used, because we have developed an automatic association to silver slaying monsters like werewolves. I think that this could have been communicated in Skyrim in a couple of ways. One, you make three categories just like the categories in the tree currently, and you combine those weapon types, making each perk point used go further. So for example, combine swords and maces into one perk point. Sword 
swords get 10% crit chance and an extra 25% extra critical damage. The second group, axes and swords, get the same kind of perks, as does maces and axes, which is the third group. By doing this, you're communicating to the player that they should always be using different types of weapons on different enemies and have each weapon play an important role in killing an enemy of that type. Something maybe about axes being able to cause extra damage against monster types feels right, maces being good against armored enemies as good as it is, and swords being good at big bursts of damage against unarmored foes like monsters or light armor penetration. I think that those values needed to be doubled in order to be useful. Maybe if you didn't cap damage resist, you could have made maces a little more overpowered against NPCs and that may have driven the point home to people, especially when they started swinging against an enemy and doing basically no damage, but then they switched to a mace and oh, it's devastation time. But that might have been a bridge too far in terms of balance, which would likely go right out the window. The other fuck thing about the sword perk is it goes off of base weapon damage, which means no bonuses from enchantments or sharpening at the smith. It's kind of dog shit, and anyone telling you different is a liar working for the empire. This is also the tree where you get dual flurry, which increases the speed for dual wielders by 20 and 35%, and dual savagery, which makes your power attacks 50% stronger, and I want you to imagine using an orc. Sneaking up behind someone, popping your daily power, and then using a power attack for 38 times more damage! My math might be wrong on that, but it's pretty close. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ! That's a lot of damage! The rest of these perks are pretty inconsequential, save for maybe paralyzing attack, but two-handers get the access to that as well. And speaking of two-handers, let me tell you about my favorite skill in the game. It's called Sweep. What Sweep does is calls all your side power attacks to hit all enemies in front of you. What's the cone of this attack, you might be wondering? I don't know for sure, but it looks like a 180 degree cone. So when you're in a group fight, get a nice conga line going and spam those side power attacks because it likes to stagger opponents. So not only does it act as an AOE, but it also acts as crowd control. The rest is pretty much the same as one-handed weapons with Warhammer standing in for maces. Archery can be explained in two words, stupidly powerful. Not only is it ranged, but it's also got many of the same buffs as the melee tree. And with the addition of power shot, which will stagger most enemies, 50% of the goddamn time! Combined with the bow drawing 30% faster and a chance to paralyze motherfuckers, they can't even get to you. Even if you weren't using stealth to headshot a motherfucker for three times damage from all the way on the other side of the map, I mean fuck, if you aren't one-shotting people from the shadows, you're paralyzing them by shooting them in the dick with rapid fire arrows. The effect of rapid fire is hilarious in VR by the way, it really makes you feel like a shittier, out of shape Legolas. Sneak on the other hand is ridiculous no matter what weapon you're using, as it should be. I mean, if you get the drop on someone, there's no reason that they should live through that. At the highest level, Assassin's Blade gives your daggers a 15 times buff to sneak attacks, while normal weapons do 6 times damage with the backstab perk. What I really like about this tree is the Shadow Warrior perk, which allows you to engage and then run away and crouch to lose detection and disengage. Reminds me a lot of the tactics a thief uses in Guild Wars 2 World v World Combat, popping in and out of smoke fields and nearly permanent stealth to pop a couple shots off on people guarding points, slowly whittling their health down to nothing. It's a nice premise, but if combat isn't difficult, which it likely isn't for you at this point, then popping back into stealth after being discovered isn't likely going to get you that much use, especially since dual savagery exists and is a thing. Block is one of my favorite skill trees, and not because I prefer to sword and board, but because of quick reflexes. There's seriously not a better skill in any tree for a melee character. You become Neo, essentially, dodging power shots and getting behind enemies that thought they had you dead to rights. Now I've heard shield charge is also really good, but I haven't played enough with one-handed characters to really come up with an opinion on that one. Another great perk in this tree is elemental protection though. Getting to literally block a spell is nice, and that 50% damage mitigation is sexy as fuck against the dragon boys. This is a great tree for anyone interested in giving the enemy a bloody nose or just being fond of beating things to death when you're right there in their face. Heavy armor. Now let's talk about Reflect Blows. Now, I'm gonna come right out and say this right now. I'm not totally sure how Reflect Blows works, but what I think happens here, and this is from reading what other people have said of it and kind of doing my own little bit of research here, I can tell you that this is not a perk to even bother taking. So from what I understand, after your damage mitigation, which is capped at 80% and can be brought up to 97%, if I understand how the math works with block, all of that is taken away from the damage done to you 
two, and then that 3% is what potentially gets redirected at the enemy. 3% of the damage meant for you that you've blocked. That's it. So it only reflects the damage you actually take. So not only are you taking the damage, but you're only reflecting back like this little tiny portion, so it's not worth it. Some highlights on this tree though are conditioning, which makes it so that heavy armor doesn't slow you down, as well as fitted and matching set giving you a total of 50% extra armor rating. Now, I wanna talk about the fact that the heavy armor actually slows you down. This is a great fucking thing. I think it's awesome, but here's kind of a little pitfall I've talked about before with these skills. Conditioning right there is the reason why so many people gravitate to conjuration and heavy armor. Armor because they get to do magic, but they also get to have the protection of heavy armor. It shouldn't be a thing, if I'm being completely honest. I think that you shouldn't have a perk that gets rid of the only reason you wouldn't use heavy armor, right? Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. But here's the thing. Armor type isn't all that important, as it's possible to hit the 80% damage cap with both types. So, the downside to heavy armor in movement speed and noise, while sneaking, can be negated by the conditioning perk, or the muffle effect, which is a spell that, an illusion. So, the differences seem to be purely cosmetic, and that brings us to light armor. And an explanation as to why light armor is a superior choice to heavy armor, and the difference between them not being purely cosmetic. Windwalker, to me, is the perk that seals the deal. A 50% buff to stamina regen means that you can run more often and power attack with your weapons more often without the use of potions or restoration spells and perks. Unhindered makes your armor weigh nothing when worn, which means you can carry a whole lot more shit, including weapons for different situations and armor sets. And deft movement, which, Jesus, for fuck's sakes, 10% chance to avoid all melee damage? Heavy armor is the easiest to pick in the early game, but it gets outpaced by light armor fairly quickly. The alteration tree shares all the similar aspects of all the other magic trees, so I'm only going to point out the perks that stand out from the rest. Alteration has plenty of these kind of perks. If you were to take this tree with the block tree to get 30% spell damage resist, as well as the 50% from block, as well as a 30% chance to absorb spell damage that makes it through your defenses as Magicka with the magic resistance perk and the Atronach perk. Mage armor is a great perk if you're going unarmored, and it's pretty much a requirement on my mage runs. Conjuration. The most notable perk in this tree tree are Mystic Binding and Soul Stealer, which makes soul trapping easier. This tree shines for summoning, but since I didn't have much experience with summoning, I can only assume that it has diminishing returns late game as the summons get outpaced by the level of the enemies that you fight. Destruction. This perk tree is the most straightforward in my opinion. It provides flat bonuses, and aside from empowering dual wielding spells, it doesn't significantly change the way you play the game. Impact, on the other hand, is a crazy good perk, and it is a 100% guaranteed way to stagger an opponent. You can basically crowd control an entire room of enemies if you time the charge up right. You'll never take damage. That one ability makes the entire game a fucking cakewalk, honestly. Restoration. Highlight of this tree is recovery. This perk, fully upgraded, increases your magicka regen by 50%. Avoid death is another great one because it allows you to heal 250 health whenever you fall below 10% health. But listen, it sounds great on paper, but the way death works in this game and most Motherfucker, I hate this system, is if the hit kills you, you do not in fact avoid death as the title suggests, you die. Necromage is an exploit that allows all spells applied to you when a vampire have 25% more effect. Yikes. Think about all the enchanting and smithing uses one could come up with with that perk. Ward Absorb is another highlight for those going unarmored. Your warding spells absorb spells and restore your magicka. Illusion. Even though this spell line was gimped greatly, this perk tree has one really good perk. Quiet Casting. All spells and shouts are cast without sound, so you can cast spells without breaking stealth. So you know when I said that casting fury on someone would get you a bounty? Well, if you have the silent casting perk, you can cast that spell from stealth and avoid the bounty, in theory at least. This means that you can get caught stealing, aggro the entire town, escape, and use the stealth to disengage and calm all aggro from stealth and walk casually out of town. Give it a try on a playthrough and see if it works for you and let me know in a comments below. I'm lumping all the crafting skills together because they're all really the same with just a few standouts. For enchanting, the standout here is extra effect, which allows you to place two fucking enchantments, motherfucker! Arcane Blacksmith allows you 
to improve weapons and armor that have enchantments, which is a pretty important perk in smithing. And alchemy has the purity perk, which takes the negative effects off potions you make and positive effects off poisons you make. Thief utilities have some pretty unique perks as well, though I find them less than useful for me. Firstly, I don't do too much pickpocketing, as it isn't up to me whether I fail a check or not, and it always feels too random. I actually liked this system from Kingdom Come Deliverance if it had a little more responsiveness. Lockpicking, on the other hand, is a useless tree, but not because it's lame. There are some good perks in there, such as Unbreakable, which makes it so that your lockpicks never break, and Treasure Hunter, which increases the chance of finding one extra weapon or armor, which may or may not be enchanted by 50% in generic chest found in dungeons. The actual percentage chance is about 10 to 15%. The reason I never bother with this tree is that lockpicking is so unbelievably easy in Skyrim that I've never needed to invest in it, so why waste the points? And let me tell you that by the time you get to like level 13, you're going to have about 60 lockpicks in your inventory. You're not going to run out. And that will just about wrap it up for the skill trees. Like I said, at the beginning of this chapter, the skills reworks has its ups and its downs, but it is overall an improvement over the older systems because of the freedom it gives you and how much it changes up gameplay later on. The real problem I have with all these changes is the nixing of the attribute system, but again, nixing the attributes might have given them the freeform style that they needed to make all of this possible, so maybe it was a devil's bargain, less depth in one place for more depth elsewhere, but I don't like it by default that depth is removed. Call me an elitist, I, I don't know, <laughs> I'm an RPG elitist, I just like seeing numbers. Numbers are very representative of what's going on in our world, it kind of helps us predict how things are going to go, right? So if we have all of the numbers at our disposal, it's just all of them, and we can see them and are transparent, you know, we can make decisions much better, more informed, eh, whatever, maybe I'm just crazy. All right, moving on. From an aesthetic standpoint, Skyrim's pretty on point. Character models are crisp and stylized without losing the look of Elder Scrolls. Elves still look like aliens. Khajiits still look like cats, and Argonians look like they give terrible blowjobs. The Nordic setting adds a lot of personality and flavor to the design of weapons and armor, and on the special edition of Skyrim on PC, the texture resolution looks a lot better compared to vanilla, but from what I understand, they didn't actually like re-render the texture maps from the high poly sources for things like normal maps or anything like that. And they most certainly didn't redo the diffusion maps from scratch, so uh, apparently they took the HD textures from the DLC and resampled them up to 4K, which results in textures that look a little bit muddy when you compare them to the modded vanilla Skyrim. I will say this, I didn't notice too much of a difference in the two versions save for the god rays in Skyrim and the rain occlusion, which is a fancy way of saying that rain doesn't go through roofs anymore. The graphical design is just so much more professional than their previous outings. The UI was given a bit of sheen even though it's still consolified dreck that hurts my eyes to look at and for some reason you can never seem to detect that I have hovered my fucking mouse over an option. The minimalist monochromatic borders and directional menu system is a nice change of pace, and the addition of a favoriting system is exactly what the series needed. I remember being impressed with what Bethesda did when I played this game for the first time because at that point in the company's histories, their graphical ability, when it came to characters at least, had been memed on for two straight games. Plus now you can have, you know, beards. Not only had the graphics gotten better, but their character creation tool got a big and much needed overhaul. Remember what I said in the Oblivion analysis when I said lips, eyes, and nose? Well, they changed it for the better. There are many different nose types, eye shapes, and lips to make your face and the rest of the NPCs in the world look unique. As far as magical effects, shooting fire and ice and lightning from your hands was all that any reviewer could talk about when the game was released, and for good reason. It's a pretty cool effect that I hadn't seen done with magic in first person games yet. Overall, I think that Bethesda kind of knocked this shit out of the park. You know what they didn't knock out of the park though? Stores. In particular, how they handle them, I mean. So as far as I could tell, the way that the NPC shops in-game work is that everything they sell is contained in a chest that is underneath of the ground. So if you can say, find the hidden place that Bethesda keeps these chests, like say, in Dawnstar, you would be able to sit there forever, selling and reselling the same gear to the Khajiit outside to level your speech to 100, or simply steal everything, come back later and do it again. You don't even need to play the game. It's a 10 out of 10 design. Usually when populating towns with lists of shit like this, a programmer might use an external list, like a JSON file, or some kind of proprietary file system. And in that list are things like the items that a vendor contains. Some games even use those lists as a database of all items contained in the game, and when they need to pull an item from that list, it is easy enough to do so without too much overhead. I guess this concept was foreign to Bethesda and instead opted to go with this chess system, the same chess system they use 
Fallout 76. I want to point out that this was the solution to a problem that was already solved years ago, but it is a solution to a problem that was created by Fun Systems from previous entries in the Elder Scrolls series. For example, stealing. It used to be that everything that an NPC sold you was pulled directly from one of their many shelves, and if you had a half-working brain, you could come back to that shop, like in Daggerfall, and steal everything from the shop and sell your ill-gotten gains to another shop. In Morrowind, they fixed the imbalance balance issues in the economy by making it so every shopkeeper in town has a crippling skooma and moon sugar addiction that allows them to stay up all night and never sleep. Now that may have chipped away at a slice of your immersion for sake of balancing the economy, but there was a much better solution. Just do guard shifts. Have guards shift in and out, and in the middle of the shifts, if the player times it right, they could steal everything from the shopkeeper. This would have created some pretty neat little gameplay situations where the player has to work their way out of a constantly changing situation. But Skyrim's like, nah, fuck all that bullshit. Chess with all the shopkeeper shit are under the floorboards where the players can't get to them, but they never seem to expect shit like this, do they? And as a result, Bethesda is always getting caught with their pants down when we, the player, break their games as if we are all collectively a part of Bethesda's quality assurance department. And now, for a special announcement from my friend, Pussy Slayer 23 I wasn't always the man, the Adonis, that you see before you today. I was poor, I was weak, and homeless. Just like you. Just like me? Just like you! And the other thing I had going for me was the knowledge that I had inside my head. I wrote my first book, Doors to Oblivion, when I was homeless, living in the backseat of my Dodge Dart. And before you knew it, I was out on the street slanging my book on Hollywood Boulevard and smashing pussy in the backseat of that old beater. Through hard work and dedication, I managed to find buyers all around Tamriel, and Rifton, and Riverwood, and White Run. In a few weeks, I had amassed a fortune equaling 14,000 gold. But that wasn't enough for me. Mediocrity is never enough for the driven. I heard that there was a camp just outside of White Run, and in that camp was a guy that knew how to turn iron into gold. Surely, this would be a profitable venture, so I went to have a word with those lovely people. I figured they'd be bros, but they were not very bro-like. They were the furthest thing from it, my dudes. Now you might be thinking, oh no, Pussy Slayer, whatever will you do? Well, I'm not just the slayer of puss, friends, no. When events call for it, I'm also a slayer of men. I wanted to bargain with them, play the role of the businessman, but these motherfuckers done brought out the old me and put these bitches on they back. The book I needed was in the table in the back of they little cave, and now I had the ability to turn dog shit into bling. In just a few days, I managed to amass a fortune. And you know what they say, you have to look the part you're playing. So if I want people to think I'm a magical son of a bitch, I need to look like one. But iron isn't infinite, my fellow push slayers in training, and money isn't everything. If you're gonna attract the kind of ridiculous hentai women I attract, you need a body to match your 401k. How do I do it? Path of least resistance. See, you need friends. In fact, you need an entourage. And if you're the type of person that likes to get up in people's faces and stab them in it, then I know just the type of friends that you're gonna wanna get. Go to White Run and befriend the companion. Do they little missions until the old man running the place croaks and names you the head of that particular establishment. Once the man has put out the pasture, turn that place into a strip joint and have your friends join you on a little excursion. This trip is nothing more than an excuse to get them to train you. And just like a true friend, if you ask him to borrow your money back, they'll give it up willingly. Then you can rinse and repeat until you have a body like mine. Now let's say you out there banging on a bandit's head with a club and realizing, man, this shit's taking too long. You need a weapon befitting a pussy slayer. But this is no ordinary weapon. You have to break the very laws of physics. And I'm gonna teach you how to do this manly feat with only a wooden plate. Take your plate in your tiny little virtual hands and press your forehead against it with all of your strength. Repeat the mantra. I have learned the ways of puss. All of its mysteries are open to me. And just as your heart chakra opens, bam! 
you're in another fucking room on the other side of the fucking wall. On the table is the prize, a weapon worthy of one of your title, the Ebony Blade. This weapon requires nothing of the user. No tactics, no potion chugging, nothing, no sweat. Just sword swinging, toe tapping fun. And if you're worried that your favorite weapon's becoming useless later on in the game, and if your entourage is no longer pulling their own weight, you got a clockwork orange them motherfuckers right in the nuts. And now you're ready to play the game, and all you needed was your index finger. And Pussy Slayer. Slaying puss since 1993. And this has been a rant from strategy, and now that you heard it, go take a bath. Everyone in the bunker is too embarrassed to say it, but it kind of stink. All right, final verdict time. How do I feel about Skyrim? Well, I kind of fucking love this game, but for reasons totally different than the reasons I loved Oblivion and Morrowind. Skyrim's the type of game like Grand Theft Auto titles that you can just sit down no matter what's going on in your life and play the game without distractions or breaking your brain. The mod community has continued to support this game in ways that are both creepy and astounding. Skywind and Sky Oblivion are just two of the most notable examples of the kind of dedicated following this game has and with good reason. So yeah, final verdict, yeah, I kind of love Skyrim. Just want to say thank you to everybody for sticking around and everything and uh, the people who've been supporting the channel, been out there, you know, sharing the video on Twitter and everything. Uh, I think it's uh, Recchietta Media. Uh, I'll put a link to their Twitter down below. But uh, they recently shared out our video and got a big boost for uh, hypernormalization, which that was a video that kind of flew under the radar a little bit. And I want to thank all the people who are patrons. You guys keep me afloat. And I have a very special announcement. Uh, I have just recently put in my two-week notice at EA, Electronic Arts. I no longer work there as, as of two days ago. <laughs> well, I still have two weeks, but... Uh, I will no longer be working there. I'll be doing YouTube full-time for a little while and see if it works out for me. So uh, more than ever, if you guys are interested in supporting the channel on Patreon, let, you know, go ahead and give it a visit and, you know, kick me a dollar or whatever. If uh, you're not interested in supporting it that way, you can always support us by sharing the video on Twitter. Uh, the next video we're going to be working on is Disco Elysium. That video is going to be... I don't know. I don't even know how I'm going to tackle that video, to be honest. It's such a weird game. Um, so expect that out. Hopefully we can get it out in two weeks. If not, we might have to start chunking these things. Skyrim is such a big fucking game. And I really wanted to break that video up into several pieces because it's just such a big fucking game. So I'm actually thinking about doing a new series. Uh, it'll be... Uh, it'll be based on the factions of these games, so like Oblivion and, and Skyrim, I might be giving each faction its own video, but I'm not quite sure how to tackle it yet. So if you guys have any ideas on how you'd like to see me tackle those topics, please let me know. Or if that's something that just doesn't even interest you at all, let me know that too. All of that stuff's very valuable information, because <laughs> I want to keep you guys interested in watching. So uh, anyway, yeah. Thanks for sticking around all this time. Um, so next video is going to be Disco Elysium. And then after that, we're probably going to tackle the Fallout series. Or we might go back and do the Oblivion factions, the Skyrim factions, and then the expansion packs. Which, really, they deserve their own video. So anyway, uh, thanks everybody. Peace out.